London is not just some city. Its spirit stands outside of time. Certain places have influenced its citizens. It is not only a setting, but a presence, a character in various films, novels and poems. My name is Philip Röttgers and I search for London's spirit. I think there are two particular ways to explore the powerful and mysterious place that is London, through literature and through walking. Follow me into a secret world. Follow me to London beyond time and place. In this series I will explore its spirit by walking the city and talking to London enthusiasts. I invite you to join me. Together we will discover London beyond time and place. This is Talks Beyond Time and Place. Hello everybody to today's episode of Talks Beyond Time and Place. My name is Philipp Röttgers and my guest today is, and I hope I'm going to get that right, Professor Dr. Dr. Colonel Bradley Harper. Was yeah, that correct? Genau. Perfect. Perfect. Great. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Brad is a retired, uh, yes, a retired U.S. Army pathologist. And after he retired from service, he took up writing, which is a great idea, I think, uh, and also produced great results, which we'll talk about in a minute. And uh, his first novel was A Knife in the Fog, which I have here, uh, in which the unlikely company of a young Arthur Conan Doyle, Miss Margaret Harkness, and Professor Joseph Bell, who many believe to be an inspiration for Sherlock Holmes, uh, are involved in the hunt for Jack the Ripper. So welcome, Brad. Very good to have you here. Oh, Philip, thank you very much for this for this chance to uh, to to talk with you. I enjoyed watching your interview with uh, my hero and friend uh, Richard Jones, who's a a ripperologist like yourself. Yes, so, yes. And the funny thing is, well, not even funny, but uh, I got to know your book because you did an interview with him also, and I watched that last year. And I said, oh, this is this looks nice. I'm going to order that. So yeah, Richard, uh, Richard is very good in bringing people together, I think, even if he doesn't know, maybe doesn't know right now that he was responsible for that. But he will probably see. So, Brad, as I said, you are uh, an American, but I think you are a member of the Victory Services Club, which makes you an honorary Londoner. So, I hope so. I hope <laughs> yes, so, yeah. I think it does. Uh, so before we start talking about the book, can you maybe tell us a bit about you and your career as an U.S. Army pathologist and maybe how you ended up writing writing fiction? Okay, well, you know, the most interesting stories are not a straight line from point A to point B. Just I'm warning you. It's okay. Also, you know, I'm part Cherokee and we're, you know, in the movies they always portray the Indians as very stoic and quiet. Well, I can tell you, for the Cherokee at least, we talk a lot. <laughs> my, uh, my grandfather, he was half Cherokee, and his Cherokee name was uh, Gulagug, which means big mouth jug. And if he was awake, he was either talking or he was eating, but his mouth was always open. So, okay, okay, I've already won it. So, you have, have been warned. I, uh, I have. Yeah. So, yeah. So, in 1973, I graduate from university and I go in the army because I really didn't have a choice. And uh, I was in the infantry for a while, then I went into transportation corps. and. Anyway, one day I went on sick call, and the doctor who saw me was such a jerk. You know, <laughs> uh, I went home and told my wife, you know, if that guy can make it through medical school, I think I can. I mean, at that point, my career was to do my time in the Army, get out, and go be a high school Spanish and, and history teacher. Oh. So, uh, anyway, I get out, and I use my GI Bill. And I'm three semesters, I cram all the biology, chemistry, and math I can in my head. And I applied to medical school, and to my surprise and, and terror, I was accepted. <laughs> so Great. I went to the military medical school in Bethesda and got out and wound up and eventually uh, started off in internal medicine. And I went into uh, to uh, pathology because I figured out one day that, you know, there's things about medicine I really like, and there's some things that I don't. Mm -hmm. uh, what I really enjoyed was making the, the diagnosis. Once you have the diagnosis, then you just, you know, moving, you know, a little bit more of this, a little bit, of, you know, just adjusting after that. But, but I said, gosh, as a pathologist, I get to make the diagnosis all day long. I get to play yeah, all day long. And so that, that was a good fit for me. And I, I that's the direction I went uh, because I had been a prior real army officer. I kind of graduated or tended towards administrative positions and wound up with four commands, uh, a field hospital in uh, Bosnia 
and then let's see uh, Fort Lee, Virginia, uh, Fort Buchanan in Puerto Rico. And then I was about to retire after serving with U.S. Army South as the command surgeon. Army, U.S. Army South is the Army part of the Southern Command. I'd spent a lot of time in Central South America. Mm -hmm. And in fact, at one point, the FARC gave me a compliment in that they put a $1.5 million bounty on my head alive if I could be uh, kidnapped and delivered uh, to be used as a hostage. Oh. And whenever I tell anybody that, I want to make sure they understand that offer is no longer valid. Okay. Okay. <laughs> So, for all of so anyway, then I was about to retire, and I get this email from uh, personnel command. Said, "Well, how would you like to command in uh, Vicenza, Italy?" And I said, "You found the one job, the one job I could not turn down." So up until now, every time every time I'd been offered an assignment, I always discuss it with my wife. This time I said, "Honey, I'm going to Italy. Join me when you can." And <laughs> so she did. Uh, we had a great time. Anyway, I did 37 years, four months, and nine days of active duty. And got out, and then my wife and I traveled a lot for about 15 months, one of the places that we hadn't been. Mm -hmm. And then one day I woke up, I said, you know, uh, this is a lot of fun, but I want to spend the rest of my life on a cruise ship. Although my stomach might look like it. Uh, in fact, I play Santa Claus, uh, among other things. I know. So, We're going to uh, talk anyway, about this also in a minute. I had this idea for this story that wound up being Knife in the Fog. Um, I, was one, I was a huge Sherlock Holmes fan ever since one summer of I turned 13. And I lived on the edge of town of Tulsa, Oklahoma. And once a week, I'd get on my bicycle with the big wire basket in front, and I'd ride to the bookmobile that came out once a week to this parking lot at this grocery store. And I could only get four books a week. So I'd read a book a day for four days, and for three days, I'm going crazy. So finally, one time I go, and there's this entire collection of Sherlock Holmes. I said, well, that looks like it lasts me at least two days. <laughs> So I checked it out and it took me two weeks and I cried when I finished the last story because there were no more. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, since then I had this love of Sherlock Holmes. And so one day I had an idea on how uh, Sherlock, uh, Conan Doyle wrote the very first Holmes story, uh, Study in Scarlet. He wrote it in 86, came out in the, end, in the year of 87, <clears throat> but he only got 25 pounds for it. It got, you know, rave reviews and sold out very quickly. Uh, but he also had to surrender full copyright so he could never re re resell it. Yeah. And so he was so embittered by that circumstance because he had to beg people to even look at it. Uh, he said, that's it. I'm not writing any more crime stories. Waste of time. In 1890, he finally was persuaded to come back and write uh, The Sign of Four, the next home story. Then yeah. we all know what happened uh, from there. In 1888, right in the middle, was uh, Sherlock, oh, excuse me, Jack the Ripper. Suddenly started, suddenly stopped. We don't know who he was, why he started, why he stopped. And so I conceived of an idea where I could involve Doyle in the hunt for Jack the Ripper, trying to use the techniques he described in the first home story to help the Metropolitan Police and to explain why the Ripper suddenly stopped without knowingly being caught and why Doyle eventually returned to writing Sherlock Holmes. And that was the idea and I played with it. Yes, and there you go. And um, Took me three years to write. Seventy-nine agents turned me down. Number eighty said, "Well, would you do this and this and this?" So I made some changes as she as she uh, recommended. She liked it. Made some more recommendations. I did that, and then she made another a set of recommendations. I said, "Ah, you think maybe it's time for us to do a con a contract?" He said, "I think so." <laughs> so bottom line, uh, we put it out, and uh, five publishers bid on it. But one publisher said, well, what else? I think the deal was he could only offer up to so much for a first book from an unknown mm. author. Mm. So what he did was he asked my agent, well, <clears throat> what else is he working on? Well, I was about, I don't know, 11 or 12,000 words into what I thought was going to be the next book. Because I thought, you know, that was kind of fun. I think I could do another one. I had no idea, you know, concept of, you know, that it would mm. be marketable. But I was said, well, I kind of got it down. Let me try. And so I, so I told my agent, well, I, I've got this book I'm working on. She said, write me a synopsis in two hours. He's going on vacation for a week, and I have to get it back to him in two hours. So in 45 minutes, I wrote out <laughs> what I thought the book was going to be about. And I sent it to her. He sent it to him. He liked it, or he liked it well enough to use it as an excuse to get the first book. And, <laughs> and we, we got on with this, uh, this two-book deal. And there you right. go. So book one was a finalist for the Edgar Award for best first novel by an American. It did win the Silver Fountain Award 
at Killer Nashville, which is a huge regional uh, writers conference as Best Mystery. <clears throat> and then the second book, which was kind of just like, a, oh, yo, by the way, it won uh, both Best Suspense in 2020 and Book of the Year at, at Killer Nashville. Right. Uh, yeah. So that's the good news. The bad news is the sales weren't, despite winning these awards and getting some rave reviews, the sales haven't been, you know, what I would like, and my publisher has dropped me. So, you know, I'm hmm. uh, back to the drawing board. My agent said that I can't really continue that series because another publisher would be very reluctant to, to pick up a series that, it, mm -hmm. that someone else had already dropped. So the book I'm working on right now, actually there's two books I'm working on, one with a, another writer and then one on my own. The one I'm doing on my own is a, another Holmes pastiche. And in this story, I have uh, Sherlock Holmes takes on the one client you would never expect, and that would be Professor Moriarty. Ooh. They declare a brief truce to work <laughs> together on something of mutual interest. Wow. And uh, my working title is The Adventure of the Purloined Contralto. Ooh, that sounds exciting. That sounds I hope exciting. so. Yes. I hope so. I anyway, I'm that. having fun with it. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> I was reworking the, uh, the opening uh, just before we started this. And so I, I have Watson is saying you know, he had just recently uh, uh, acquired a typewriter. So he's in 221B Baker Street. He's typing away. And after about two hours, it's driving Holmes crazy. <laughs> and he says, if you continue, you know, I'm going to take that typewriter and throw it out the window onto two cats, you know, uh, amorous cats below, and I'll <laughs> solve two use, two problems in one go. Great. But I think you, you, you've you managed to find a publisher with, with that. I, think. I hope so. Yeah, I think you will. So for all of all the publishers who are watching, <laughs> this is your opportunity. So, but um, Brad, so you've, you've always been fascinated with history or you've always been interested in, in history when you also say that you, you planned to kind of make, turn it into a job also uh, before you became a pathologist. So, um, and your, your first, uh, what was the first uh, home story that you read? Do you remember? Was it um, a study? Well, I started them in, 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 in series. My very first one was a study in, in, in Scarlet because it was collection. So it was in, in sequence. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. that's, that's how, how I, I've read the stories. And um, I just recently reread The Valley of Fear mm -hmm. because my, the, my current work in progress begins right after The Valley, uh, uh, the Valley of Fear ends. And so I'm kind of picking up because this is where I, you know, I explain why Holmes and Moriarty meet. It has something to do unrelated to the Valley of Fear, but the timing is, mm -hmm. is right. And uh, which is, I kind of tag on onto that. Sorry. Which, which year is, is that? During the Holmes? Uh, okay. It's sorry. okay. This is, a, you know, this is a confusing story. If you're really, if you're really uh, into chronology. Because in the final problem, we are introduced to Professor Moriarty. Now, oh, it's the very first time, right? Okay. Yeah. Last time. Holmes dies, or right. we, we all, all think he does. And then Doyle is eventually persuaded to go back and, and writing Holmes some more. So in his chronology, uh, his imaginary world, <clears throat> the Valley of Fear happens before uh, the final problem. And Moriarty is in that. So Watson gets introduced to Moriarty twice. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I see. Yeah, it's how else would you could you solve that? And yeah, but I think that's a good way if you put it before that. That's yeah. a good, good way to do it. Okay. So, so in, fi yeah. in fiction, you know, we ask the reader to suspend disbelief, and so you know, this is Holmes. Just go with it. Yeah. Doyle was not a stickler for consistency between stories at all. That's right. Yeah. So when did you first uh, stumble across the name of Jack the Ripper? When did you first get to know about the case? <laughs> hmm. Boy, that's a good question. Um, I, I really couldn't say when I first heard about him, but uh, uh, probably in a movie. I did see the movie uh, Murder by Decree, which features uh, Sh Sherlock Holmes uh, in, you know, versus Jack the Ripper. And mm -hmm. uh, that was very well done. And. I, I suspect I knew before then, but even so, that was a, a good, it, it gave me some good background to it, not just the name, but, you know, the circumstances of, of, of his murders. Yeah. So when you were introduced to the case, there was basically also a bit of a connection to, 
to Sherlock Holmes. Yeah. So, as I said, and you said also, uh, two of the main characters in the book are uh, Arthur Conan Doyle and Professor Bell, who uh, many believe to be one of the inspirations for Sherlock Holmes. So, uh, was it difficult to to write and, and work with real real life characters to write them in a way that they, you know, that, that you thought this is okay, <laughs> this is the way they probably were. <laughs> No, actually, you know, I think I was very fortunate because the real people that I put in there were so interesting that it was easy to visualize them. Mm -hmm. uh, when I'm writing, I like to have a picture of the person, the character, you know, mm -hmm. open in a browser so I can look at that and have a very clear vision in my mind what they what they look like. Mm -hmm. And I read their, their biographies <clears throat> in the... Um, and of course, there's Margaret Harkness, who is a fascinating woman that very few people have, have, have heard about. And I owe Richard Jones a great debt for mentioning her in his book. And she was a, a Christian socialist, uh, a suffragette and a union organizer. And she was living in Whitechapel at the time of the, of the Ripper murders because she wrote about the working poor and she wanted to live like her characters so she could actually portray uh, their lives. And so there are, there are no photographs of, of, uh, of Margaret. There is one uh, pencil drawing mm -hmm. of her face, and that's all. Uh, and she, although she was, you know, very well known, you moved amongst uh, society uh, of the, uh, the, uh, the Fabian society, among others, and, but no photographs are known to exist. And so that makes her a little bit mysterious. Right. I had a lot of fun writing her. And um, just to say, and I was also fortunate about writing about real events that happened over a period of time that gave me an internal framework. Although this is a work of fiction, I can't very well change the, the names of the victims or where they were murdered mm -hmm. or the date or the time. And so, so I had these events I knew had to happen at this point in the story. Mm -hmm. I was able then to, so that helped, you know, steer me along a certain arc, if you will. When yeah, I'm telling that sure. story. And I think uh, you also said that, that, Margaret was the character that surprised you the most and, and uh, was the most fascinating. And, and she, she was actually, you, you planned her as a minor character, right? And then she turned into one of the major characters also. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. because she lived in, in Whitechapel, she is initially contracted to be a guide for Belle and Doyle as they go through Whitechapel to try to, you know, pick up clues about uh, Jack the Ripper. And uh, I was only going to put her in a couple of scenes to kind of show the uh, the status of women at that time, even a woman who was well educated and published in her own right, uh, and every time she was on the on the page, it just you know sparks flew, yeah. and um, I wish I could say I was this smart to figure it out, but only once the book was completed did I realize that I'd taken my my three characters who call themselves the Three Musketeers. Mm -hmm. um, I had Belle, Doyle, and Margaret, each portrayed one aspect of the human personality and Doyle is ego and mm -hmm. the ego doesn't mean egotistic but in ego you know life is very this way very rigid like a five-year-old you know yeah the peas can't touch the carrots things have to be a certain way right. he's a middle-class Englishman who abides by the rules and he's always a line waiting to, or you would say Q waiting to form uh, Bell was super ego he was the adult in the room he could stand back and say yes mm -hmm. there rules have a have their place, but sometimes to achieve a larger purpose, you have to go around them, circumvent them. And then uh, <clears throat> Margaret is pure id. Yeah. She says what she thinks as soon as she thinks it. Um, and um, most of us, while we admire them, we have to have two or three string, uh, stiff drinks before we can emulate them. And so the uh, interplay of those three distinct personality types made for something that was larger than the sum of their, of their uh, parts. And I, uh, I got some criticism of my second book that I didn't have the three of them working together in that story as well. And I really wanted to, but it just wasn't, uh, wasn't realistic. Right, yeah. And also maybe because um, there, there's a kind of a prologue where uh, that, that is set in the, in the 20s, I think. Um, so it wouldn't really fit into this kind of story if you... Would would put this uh, the three of them together again in another in another story. It wouldn't fit right. into that into what you what you said there. Yeah, but I, I agree, and I, I think um, one can read when when 
when one reads this wonderful book, uh, that that she she's she's the one that you or the especially when you add the three of them together, that something developed from there, the dialogue, the the interplay, the interaction. That was really something. Um, yeah, that was maybe the. I mean, the whole book is great, but that was the the the, the most. I don't know, interesting part, you know, where, oh, this is a, this is just great. I love reading when these three are together. So even up to a point, at least that was my, uh, when I read it, that when I thought, I think it's even more interesting to, to watch these three kind of solve the case up. Uh, and it's not the most interesting thing that to find out who the murderer was. <laughs> it was more interesting to, to witness the three of them uh, doing it. And what I also liked very much is, um, that she included, uh, uh, of course, you included uh, Inspector Frederick Eberlein, and the way you portray him, which is, of course, more probably more more realistic than all these film adaptations where he where he was portray portrayed in a, in very different ways. And I, I think you probably came quite close to the real Eberlein, if he if one can say that, because we don't know. But yeah. thank you very much. You know, usually dialogue it's like a game of uh, of uh, tennis. You know, you have one characters speaking to the other and they each grab on to whatever the last person said and they go on that having three people in the discussion mm -hmm. really increased the tension both for the reader and for the writer yeah because i've got to keep all three of them meaningfully involved or i can't justify their, their their presence in that scene so it was really challenging to me and i enjoyed it but yeah i sweated a lot <laughs> i know margaret hasn't said anything for half a page i need to get her to you know yeah. to to, uh, to contribute or do something so it was uh it was a, a lot of fun yeah let me see you said something oh aberline yeah, yeah aberline i really respected him he was a hard-working honest cop who finally makes it to scotland yard mm -hmm. uh, due to his hard work and exemplary uh, performance when what happens the murders begin he gets jerked right back where he, where he had what? just worked to get out of and he was greatly admired by the inspectors under him his colleagues and um and so i wanted to portray an honest hard-working cop who was really trying to do the right thing yeah and uh no no nonsense but you know um honest and fair and suspicious of these amateurs who suddenly show up and say hey we we'd like to help you out Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you you really managed to to capture that, I think. And what I also find very interesting is the, um, you know, when you when you when someone writes about the Ripper and the, the the Ripper case, it's always a bit dangerous for many writers, I think, or many people, writers fall into this trap to uh, to lean too much on one particular suspect. And uh, I find it interesting how you deal with 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 the Ripper. Uh, we do, don't want to give away too much. But uh, I think it's it's an interesting approach. So so why and when did you choose to maybe portray him the way uh, you did, or to yeah to turn this to to make this character to create this character? Okay, well, every character in a story is a uh, metaphor for something. They're not real people. They're a, a metaphor, and to me, the Ripper is a metaphor for for uh, for evil. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did not want to glorify him. I did not want to make him look like you know, like there was anything noble about him whatsoever, and I made it. I would, did my very best to portray to make his victims real people, and not caricatures or props to this guy's mm. in, uh, fame or in, infamy, I should say. And so, keeping him, uh, I don't want, as you said, I don't want to say too much, but I didn't. Really, he was the cause they were together. And I thought the real story was the uh, the uh, the uh, the friendship mm -hmm. that these three totally different people forge in pursuit of a noble cause was much more important than the person who caused it to happen. Right. Yeah, that's right. Do you have a personal the theory about who the Ripper was? <laughs> oh, you know, people ask me that question, and I always answer that mysteries sell books. Yes, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> and I, I always say, I, actually, although people try to to solve that case for one hundred and thirty odd years, uh, we we don't really want to know because it would, you know, the mystery would would go away. And I think actually we don't really want to know who he was. So, and it, it's a good. I think it's a good thing that the, the more time passes, the the further we 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 are getting away. We get away from. 
funding uh, Patricia here. Patricia Cornwall wanted to uh, exhume the body of Mary Kelly for reasons I don't know yeah. uh, but you know she was uh, buried in a, in a pauper's graveyard and uh, there were a lot of the people buried there as well and then during the Blitz the graveyard was used for a lot of the poor who died during during World War II and so it was estimated that they would have to go through the bones of about 150 other people to possibly find hers. And so you would have to get a, a permission from every mm -hmm. possible family member uh, that could be possibly, the remains could be disturbed. And so it was finally you know, found not, not to be practical. And personally, I would say, let her rest. Right. And, and let the mystery r remain that way and just serve as a, as a object uh, lesson yeah to uh, I don't know uh, society yeah, I agree. it was interesting to me and in my research um, I uh, there was a television show called murder maps and it mm -hmm. talked about the density of populations in uh, London at the time and so I did some research on my own and the 1890 census which is you know two years after the Ripper in an um, English village the average human density was about 25 people per acre and the West End of London, where the well-to-do lived, it was about 50 people per acre. In uh, Whitechapel, it was about 860 people per acre. Yeah. And just to me, the human density just boggles my mind. Right. Now, about half of the people there were, uh, were uh, children. But even so, these people were stacked on top of each other. And that the Ripper could go through the streets at night in courtyards and murder women and not be caught, that just ooh, blows my mind. Yeah, it does. It does. Right. Mine too. Uh, I also th I think when you just mentioned Mary Kelly, I think you really, uh, I, I like that you also included that on, on the day of her, of the, her murder, there was also the, the Lord Mayor's Day <laughs> uh, parade, just, just basically a few streets further uh, west in, in the city. So these two e events, you know, the, you, that you mirror them in a way, I really liked, really liked that. Thank and I, you. I, yeah, I'm really proud of, proud of that scene. And yeah. I read Richard's book, and mm -hmm. uh, he didn't mention it then. We did a we did the walking tour together, and he mentioned, oh, by the way, and it just struck me that here we have the pomp and circumstance of the Lord mm -hmm. Mayor's installation, and a little bit more than a mile away, uh, they're bringing out the body of this woman in this plain wooden box. Right. And thousands of people at the ceremony, when they heard that another Ripper victim had been found, left in their yeah. best yeah. clothes to stand there in silence and watch her come out yeah and so although no and the newspapers said at the time that everyone stood stock still mm -hmm. and you couldn't you could have heard you know a a, a, a pen drop everyone was mm -hmm. totally silent and so they didn't mention this but at least in my version you can hear far off the sound of the music and the cheer of the crowd to contrast with this other very yeah. somber scene yeah that's right well uh I wanted to say last year, but no, it was 2019 because time flies and because of COVID. But in 2019, I, I was in I was in London um, during yeah or in in November and also on the on the 9th of November, and so in the in the morning I kind of paid a tribute. I, I went to um, to where Miller's Court used to be with with, with the, this fruit and wool exchange building where you can go into this in a yard or stand in the street before that where there used to be this parking lot and things like that. So I, I went there and kind of paid a tribute and then I went to to watch the, the Lord Mayor's Day and I thought this is strange because this is something that people did you know 130 years ago, 131 years ago also maybe the other way around but this it's sometimes a bit a bit strange how these things you know they, they, there's these things repeat themselves and there's these these traditions. Yeah. When I was when I was in Bosnia, uh, there was a British gentleman who took care of all our our, uh, our computers, and mm -hmm. we had telemedicine, which was a brand new thing, and so he kept all that running. And um, one day he said to me, he said, "Sir," he said, "You know the difference between a European and an American?" And I said, "No." He said, "A European is someone for whom a hundred miles is a long way." He said, "American is someone for whom a hundred years is a long time." Oh yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah, good. Yeah, this, this is a good good comparison. Or uh, yeah, I, absolutely right. That's absolutely right. Yeah, I I will remember that. I I, I like that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, 
you also um I, I wanted to ask you also because as you we also talked about a bit about your your military years so did it um did, did it help you know being uh, you performed mul multiple forensic examinations uh, was this helpful when when you wrote the novel or when you read the autopsy reports of the of the ripper victims it, it, it was very helpful uh The state of forensics at the time of, uh, of the Ripper murders was really very, uh, very uh, primitive compared to uh, today. They were just starting to use photography. And because it was a new technology, they used commercial photographers. There's no standardization as to views, to angles, mm -hmm. anything or distance, uh, anything like that. And the photographers would take the extra prints and or whatever, and, uh, and they would sell those to the newspapers. Yeah. Uh, you know, the British press was... Uh, not very uh, genteel in those days um, that and then there were several mistakes made the the bodies would be well the clothing that they were wearing would be thrown away and the bodies would be washed before yeah. the police surgeon would make his uh, examination and you know who knows it may have made made some difference uh, but anyway the, the whatever clues that might have been there were, were just uh, were just totally lost yeah, yeah and so having done forensic cases myself uh, that that stood out to me and I incorporated that <clears throat> uh, and then my other military experience being a commanding officer I use that in the second book somewhat as I mentioned it's, it's a basically it's the the day of the, of the jackal about a fictional assassination attempt on a Charles de Gaulle mm -hmm. but I make it Queen Victoria and Margaret is the working right. with a, a Scotland Yard inspector to try to stop the assassin who's an anarchist assassin from killing Queen Victoria During, yeah. the, during the Diamond Jubilee. And so I mentioned some of that, you know, that at one point the uh, police commissioner who was retired army officer is inspecting the, the route the day yeah. before the uh, procession, just, you know, looking a security check. And he speaks with the inspector and then he rides off and doesn't look back to see if his men are following him because he's a commander and he knows without, without looking that the, his soldiers, his subordinates mm -hmm. will follow him automatically without order. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's it's helpful to to have this this experience and to can yeah that you can incorporate that into your stories. Uh, but I just was do you think the the criticism of the press back then was it was it justified or was it just you know not justified <laughs> against the police and and throughout the Ripper murders? Well. No. No, I don't. I don't criticize the police at all. They had a very difficult job. Mm -hmm. um, they did the best they had with the tools that they had to work with. Um, the 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 victims, uh, they since they were working prostitutes, they knew quiet nooks right. and crannies in Whitechapel where they could, you know, ply their trade and not be be disturbed. And so it's like the the ripper the the killer was using his victims to help him to choose the best place to take to take their life mm. um the police did the best they could they moved a lot of constables from other parts of london and saturated Whitechapel, both to try to uh to uh lessen the chances of the ripper and also to prevent anti-jewish uh, riots yeah because a lot of the the, the, the british press portrayed the, this one suspect in particular as looking Jewish. And there were a lot of Jewish immigrants in that, in that part of, of, of city. And the British said, well, no real, you know, no real British gentleman could do something like this. It, only an, an immigrant would, yeah. do, would stoop to something so low. So there were close to, to riots breaking out a couple of different times. One inspector, uh, in fact, the guy who ultimately caught Crippen, Yeah, he at one point he had to grab a Jewish tradesman and barricade him and the other man in the side of the house from a crowd that wanted to uh, to kill the man in, in the in the street just for walking down the street with a leather apron on. Mm -hmm. um, the the suspect was called Leather Apron because he always wore a, a, a leather apron. Yeah, and so that was like a red flag to these people. Right. Yeah. You already mentioned that you uh, you basically walk the. The streets and and all these the sides with with our mutual friend Richard Jones, and I think for for your second book Queen's Gambit, right? Uh, which, as you said, is it's um, the, this 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 planned assassination of 
Queen Victoria on her uh, jubilee. And I think it's the, the setting is St. Paul's Cathedral, at least for this scene. And I think you also you also researched uh, the the area around St. Paul's uh, uh, for yeah for the for what you wrote. So was it helpful, you know, being in the area first for the first book, but also for for the second one? Is it helpful to to visit the places that you want to write about? It was extremely helpful. Uh, there is a plaque uh, beside the steps to the entrance to St. Paul's, and it says, "This is where mm -hmm. Queen Victoria's carriage rested." And so I stood on that exact spot and, and I used my, my military experience and say, okay, if I was a sniper, mm -hmm. where would I, I like to be? And there's a, you know, a big courtyard in front and there's buildings that ring it. And I looked at the photographs at the time and there were wooden bleachers, temporary bleachers set up on top of these buildings. And so you couldn't put a sniper there because you'd, you'd be underneath those, those, uh, those bleachers. Then I looked at, at the cathedral and there is one window that looks right down from a stairwell this beautiful stairwell but mm -hmm. i thought well people would be going up and down the stairs that wouldn't work um and so i looked and there was a side street and there was one window on the corner of the building on uh, you would say second floor in uh, in europe we'd say third floor in the united mm -hmm. states and uh so i went down to that building and knocked on the door and it's a international youth hostel now but in 1897 it was the boarding school for the boys choir oh. that was perfect yeah because that means since the boys choir was on the steps that building for the most part would have been unoccupied and so i went up to they allowed me in and let me go to the window and i got up on a bunk and looked right down on where queen's victoria queen victoria's carriage would would ha have been i said this is perfect and right. so when i write this scene as the assassin uh when I built the, uh, the whole final part of how the assassin plans to, to kill the queen, how he gets to that position, and then the final climactic scene, all based upon the real place. So it was in my mind so I could describe it easily because it was a real, you know, it was actual. I, I took pictures of the place and so I could refer back to those because my memory is not the best. Uh -huh. best <laughs> and oh yeah, it really helped an awful lot. Yeah. Did you have a rifle with you? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no. Yeah. Camera. camera. Yeah, yeah, great. But yeah, I think uh, also, you know, I, I often think um, it's not only, of course, it's help, helpful to, to visit a place that you want to write about, but I also um, I think because you can see it and maybe, yeah, as you said, you can see, find out things and think, how would it have been in 1897? What did it look like? Which you know which which house would have been a good uh, a, a perfect location for a sniper but i also think it's it's uh, as, and then again especially when you walk through like an area like like uh, white chapel that you can yeah really feel something experience something that's still different from from you know just reading a book or watching it on google maps or, or just just so, some photographs i think it's at least for me i this is, of course, purely subjective, but I think there's just an atmosphere. No matter where you go, there's always an atmosphere. And if you can experience that, it's, it's very, it adds to, <laughs> to how you perceive a place and how you can write about it also. Yeah, and I think, uh, yeah. yeah, Hemingway said that your writing should be like an iceberg. Mm -hmm. And the bulk of the iceberg is under the water out of sight. But it's still there, it's supporting so just experiencing Whitechapel at night, even with, elect with electricity, it's still a pretty dim place. Yeah, right. So just imagine what it was like during you know, when it was uh, gas lit. In fact, Queen Victoria, when, uh, when London was first being electrified and putting street light lamps out, she insisted Whitechapel be one of the first places to reduce, yeah. uh, reduce the crime there. And so even though I can't point to any one particular thing in my book, I said, well, that came from this experience, just the whole feeling of it mm -hmm. uh, was there um i'm f i'm fluent in spanish of all my languages it's spanish the one i'm really most comfortable in and when i was working in well volunteering in in galicia mm -hmm. helping pilgrims on the camino i learned a word called miga m-i-g-a and mm -hmm. in the loaf of bread the very center the softest the sweetest part of the bread is called the the uh, the miga mm -hmm. and so i say and i use it to mean essence Mm -hmm. So, you know, I had the essence of that place at night in my mind. So when I'm sitting down to write, it informed my, my word choices, my description, 
you know, and uh, so it was there. It, you may not be able to point to it, but it was supporting what you mm -hmm. could see, and so it it was definitely worth it. Yeah, right, and especially with a guide like like Richard. So yeah, that's always good. Did you visit all the uh, the the sites or or just some of them? Just, just some. I think we we did about a three hour walk. Uh, oh yeah, but that's quite a lot. Well, yeah, yeah, we did, and uh, it was. Uh, um, in fact, I uh, when I got my advance for my books. Um, I gave a portion to my two daughters uh, to go because they're both huge Harry Potter fans and I paid yeah. for them to fly to London and stay for three days and see the, the Harry Potter play and some other stuff on the one condition that they take the, the Ripper tour and <laughs> present a copy of my book to, to, to Richard. Now, Richard was not their guide that night, yeah. but they didn't give it to him till the very end. And he would ask all these questions during the tour. And my daughters always say, oh yeah, I know that. I know that. I know that. <laughs> And uh, finally, at the end, the, the tour got the, uh, the guide got the book. He said, "Ah, oh, now I understand why you had you all had all the answers." Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's uh, quite quite a tour. Um, I, when I when I talk to writers, I, I often or we often talk about the um, the research, and, and many of them, and in, including me, in a way, uh, we, we say that the research often, of course, it takes more time than the writing itself, but also. Uh, it can be as fun or even more fun than the right than yeah the writing process itself does this also apply to you <laughs> oh yeah i mean i'm a huge uh, history buff um mm -hmm. and like most americans i do know that more 100 years is not that long <laughs> when i was a transportation officer living in turkey one of the four walls of my motor pool was a roman a a aqueduct mm -hmm. that was still standing so mm -hmm. that you know over 2,000 years old. And for me, from Oklahoma, you know, when I was a child, Oklahoma had only uh, been a state for like 50 years. So anything 100 years old had been built while it was still Indian territory. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, 100 years just blew my yeah. mind. Um, so I enjoyed a lot. But at some point, you have to ask, does this add to my story? Mm -hmm. In fact, I have a young lady who works from work, well, works for me. She's my assistant. She works for a number of authors, but among I'm one of, of them. And she offered to do my research for me. I said, no, that's the one thing I absolutely must do myself. Yeah. Because oftentimes I'll be looking for one thing and I'll stumble over something else, which is even more interesting than what I was right. originally looking for. And um, one example of that is in the second book, The um, I was looking for the name of the police commissioner during Queen Victoria's uh, Diamond Jubilee. A gentleman named uh, Bradford. He was a, a baronet. I have no mm -hmm. idea what a baronet is, but it sounds good. <laughs> anyway, um, so I got his name and read a little bit about him in Wikipedia. This guy only had one arm. He had been stationed in India, and he lost his left arm to a tigress. Oh. And uh, continued to serve in the army, had a full career, that said he would go boar hunting uh, on horseback with the lance. And when he needed a lance, he put the reins in his teeth. And, and hunt the boar. Wow. And uh, he was later on. He was the aide de camp to Queen Victoria for four years, and then he retired and became, you know, the police commissioner of, of London. And was he hugely successful? Uh, I won't go into great detail, but this guy was so interesting. I said, I got to put him in the story. Yeah, and right. So I, I I did. And uh, if I ever run out of ideas, I could write two or three books about this guy. He was <laughs> very very interesting. So yeah. again, I stumbled on this guy and said, Wow, I struck gold here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you you already said that the I, I think the main character in the second book, Queen's Gambit, right? The title is Queen's yes. Gambit. Is uh, Margaret Harkness again? But this time she's I don't know. Is she on her own? Or is she does she have have a companion with her in this book? Well, uh, early on she is involved. Uh, she works with Professor Bell. Oh yeah. Uh, pro in real life, Professor Bell did do some forensic cases. And so it starts off in the German government and the, um, the German security forces uh, are, you know, the big issue at that time was uh, anarchist. You know, some mm -hmm. heads of state had been assassinated and always being closely monitored. Uh, although not as much in Germany as other parts because of Bismarck, he was actually pretty uh, liberal in some aspects. Yeah, anyway, uh, long story short, uh, the German security forces realize that secrets are being somehow leaked out of their office to the anarchists. And 
they everything they can think of they can't figure out how it's happening and so they call in uh, Professor Bell to be a consultant to look at the procedures and see if he can find some way that the these things you know are being mm -hmm. leaked out and so Bell doesn't speak German so he asked Margaret Hartness to serve as his interpreter in real life a number of her books were published in German and quite popular I don't know if she translated them or not but she was she was well known in socialist circles in Germany at the time so she agrees because she's always kind of you know hard up uh, for, for money and one thing leads to another but that involvement in that case leads to the man who ultimately becomes the attempted uh, assassin having to leave Germany leave his family behind and he has great bitterness towards Margaret and uh, he's told if he kills the Queen then the the social the anarchist will help him reunite with his with his mm -hmm. with his family okay. so he so that's his his motivation uh, gosh where was i going with that so research was that, <laughs> what was the question again <laughs> uh, uh, yeah and the research also but yeah i was just wondering about the uh, uh, queen's queen's gambit oh, I, it's, okay. it's just margaret okay, yeah. as, as okay. the main character so, yeah, thank not you. the three uh, of them uh, it, i turned 70 so i'm, I'm entitled oh that's um, fine when when happy birthday when was it <laughs> thank you thank you three score and uh and uh ten anyway so she uh, comes back and uh she uh, tells the british um scotland yarn had special branch special branch mm -hmm. was their counterterrorism counterpart mm -hmm. at the time so she meets with this gentleman and says okay this is what happened over in germany i'm not a spy i just want you to know this is what we did and um Ultimately, when the, the the assassin surfaces and tries to kill her, and then later on there's intimation he's going to try to to kill the queen, she starts working with this uh, with this uh, inspector from Special Branch, and he takes her under her his wing to protect her. He's widowed, um, and she kind of gets adopted by him and his 15 year old daughter, uh, Elizabeth. And Elizabeth mm -hmm. admires Margaret very much. And so Margaret kind of becomes her mentor and teaching her how to function as a woman in a man's world. Yeah. And um, at one point, they even have Elizabeth doing surveillance on this Russian anarchist uh, who they think may be behind this whole thing. And uh, yeah. oh, so anyway, so they there's kind of a romantic uh, spark between the inspector and, and Margaret that I, I use in the story. Uh, yeah. So it, it's, it's those three t uh, this time. Bell does make another brief appearance. I do have a brief reunion with Doyle, Bell, and Margaret, as well as the inspector and his daughter, all together in the Marlboro Club, which means that both Margaret and Elizabeth have to dress as males. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. Good. That's good to know. Uh, and I think you did mention it before we officially began that there's a, there's a third book also uh, that you, or you, you appeared in in, a, in another book also, uh, yes. in an anthology. Maybe you can tell us a bit about that. Oh, oh yes. Thank you very much for mentioning that. Uh, this book comes out the 27th of April. Mm -hmm. It's How to Write a Mystery. It's published by Mystery Writers of America. And as I said, it's an anthology and some of the big names in mystery writing uh, contributed. And I'm very proud to say I have two small entries in there. I think maybe 400 words if you add up add up both uh, both of my, my entries but there's h uh, philip I. ryan there's lee childs there's uh, laurie r king uh, you know several well-known authors uh contributed yeah. to it and, and i have a small piece in there but the recognition just being have my name associated with writers like that is just a huge um ego boost to, to me and <laughs> yeah. my wife would say my ego doesn't need any more boosting than it already has ah. uh, but uh very i'm very pr proud to have been have my two entries uh, selected for yeah, being sure. part of this book. Yeah, you're in great company there. So yeah, do you um, do you also? But do you plan to maybe continue this Doyle Harkness Bell series in a way? For, well, you know, I had a couple of false starts until my agent gave me uh, some tough love and told me that you know, uh, since the book has been dropped, that other publisher, uh, the series has been dropped. That uh, another publisher probably won't take it on. So now I'm doing a, a pure Holmes pastiche, uh, and we'll just see how that goes. I'm having fun with it. Yeah. Uh, at this point, I'm used, I'm comfortable writing in Doyle's voice. So, so that's easy. I'm also working on a modern day thriller with another writer, 
Um, I think it'll be ready to show to my agent in June, which is important because the third week in June, I'm starting a master's in fine arts program. Cool. It's a combined program with Seton Hill in Pennsylvania and uh, Napier University in Edinburgh. So I'll spend the summer in <clears throat> here in the States, <clears throat> one week in Pennsylvania and the rest here in Virginia, uh, you know, on uh, correspondence. Mm-hmm. And then in the uh, end of August, I'll be moving to, to Edinburgh for one year and wow. be attending classes at Napier. It looks like we're going to do face-to-face classes by then. I'm excited. And so uh, great. I'm going to set part of that book, the, my home's pastiche, in Edinburgh because, again, I'll be able to walk walk the uh, the uh, terrain and um, great. and be able to describe things in some in some detail. Yeah. Well, I wonder what would have come out of that. That'll be that'll be great. Yeah. Um, you also, Hopefully. yeah, sure. You also do, um, and you we already talked about this uh, a bit before before we started. Uh, I, I've read quite often, and as you said uh, before, you and your wife, you also have a very different kind of job around cr- uh, Christmas time, which yes, uh, I think would make a. A great final to our talk. If you talk, told us a bit about uh, yeah your winter time job, if you like. Uh, yeah, when I retired from the army, I quit shaving because I finally could, and it <laughs> came out, out like this. And I teased my wife says, I think when you were, I told her, I says, I think when you were eight years old, you decided you wanted to marry Santa Claus, and so she was the one who encouraged me to uh, to try out for a, a a role at this local park. It's Bush Gardens in Williamsburg, Bush Gardens is part of the uh, SeaWorld uh, mm-hmm. franchise. And so it's a pretty large uh, concern. So I I said, okay, you know, why not? I tried out and to my, again, to my terror, I was accepted. And so um, I said, okay, I'll do this. So I was actually doing two things. I worked primarily and they had this uh, dinner theater. So I would come out and I'd interact with the elves and I would recite the night before Christmas and then we'd have pictures taken with the guests who were having dinner and then mm-hmm. I'd get off stage and the elves would close it out. <laughs> and then there's also the uh, the toy shop on the other side of, of the park. And there was a principal in the dinner theater and I was his understudy. He was in his 80s and so he would do like three shows a day. And we had more than that, then I would do the rest. And when I wasn't there, I'd be at the, at the uh, toy shop. So like the third day in the job, uh, I said, you know, this is a really easy job. Kids come in, we do the picture, and I ask them what they want for Christmas, and then I said, then they do the picture, and then we leave, and the next one comes in. <laughs> and as long as I don't promise them anything, other than I'll look into it, everything's fine. And then the third day, uh, one of my elves comes up to me. She said, Santa, you're about to see three children, a girl and her two younger brothers, and they've been orphaned for the last year. Oh. And... Uh, and the foster parents keeping them had just been approved to adopt them. That means they'll be able to grow up together. That was their biggest fear. They'd be split up. In yeah, sure. Houses. Yeah. And they want you to tell them. Ooh, what a responsibility. <laughs> yeah, and the boom, there they are. Yeah. And you said, I had no preparation. And so I was like, uh, well, what would you like for uh, for uh, Christmas, you know? And it was a 12-year-old girl. In, you know, at that age, she just kind of playing along. And then there was a 10-year-old boy. And at 10... They tend not to believe you, but they don't want to blow their chances just in case they're wrong. You know, it's like, "Eh, okay. The eight-year-old boy, his eyes were enormous. He believed totally. It was, you know, really great. And so they each told me what they want. I I didn't hear a word they were saying. I said, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? So they finally finished, and I nodded. And I said, okay, those are great ideas. I'll look into it. And then it came to me. I said, but I have something for you today. And they said, what's that, Santa? I said, a family. Oh, Great. And they were kind of puzzled for a second and then yeah. I explained. And there wasn't a dry eye in the house. Yeah, I believe that. Yeah. And at that the moment I became a Santa Claus. Oh yes, you did. Yeah. What a beautiful story. Wow. There must have been yeah, I I, I can't imagine it. But that must have been a very emotional but also beautiful moment, yeah. Yeah. I'm the luckiest guy I know. Yeah, yeah, you really are. Great. Okay. So I didn't want to end it, end it too emotionally for you and for our viewers, but you can you can see this side. You can see Bradley perform as Santa Claus. Maybe what last year you probably didn't didn't. I did. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They had a, a plexiglass shield, and I okay. wore a mask, and the kids wore a mask. Uh, but you know, and I kind of felt like the, 
the uh, the teller at a bank, you know, the, the drive through window. I did the best that I possibly could, mm. you know, to make it personal. But, right. You know, yeah. That was that was a real challenge. Uh, so, but you know, you do the best that you can, yeah. and to try to keep that fire, that little candle alive, a little bit longer. Yeah. What a great center. <laughs> he really you. is. So, thank you very much, Bradley. Uh, it was a pleasure to have you here today on Talks Beyond Time and Place. Once again, this is his first novel, and I've in the Fog. <laughs> the second one is Queen's Gambit, and uh, you heard him. He appears in the anthology, which will come out on 27th, right? 27th of Correct. April. And uh, we, we might expect some more from him. I think we will read some more of him uh, from so. him. Um, so I can only recommend his, this book and also the second one. Um, as I said, Queen's uh, Gambit is on my reading list. Maybe we can also have a, a separate chat just about that. We'll, we'll see. Maybe we can do a bit of a chat about that in another episode in the future. Who knows? I'd enjoy that. Yeah, me too. So I wish you all the best for, for the upcoming projects and everything that you plan to do. And uh, stay healthy. Stay safe. Um yeah say hello to your wife for me and uh, yeah thank you for being my guest today on talks beyond time and place <laughs> i will, thank you very I will much, give Brad. mrs i will give mrs claus your your very best best wishes mm -hmm.